The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on education governance next steps. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary, 15 minutes, please. President Officer, this Government was elected last year on a platform of radical and bold action to make Scottish education world class for all of our young people. That commitment has driven the changes we have already made, and it drives the reforms that we now propose. In particular, we pledge to give more power and resources direct to schools, to put teachers, parents and communities in the driving seat of school improvement. Today, with the publication of our Next Steps paper on school reform, we make good on that pledge. The aim is to deliver excellence and equity by raising the bar for all and closing the attainment gap. A simple, powerful premise sits at the heart of our proposals, that the best decisions about a child's education are taken by the people who know that child best, their parents, their teachers, their school and their community. We are determined to build an education system from the classroom out. We will reform the system so that the key decisions in a child's education are taken by our schools. Schools will be free to improve learning and teaching, making decisions as they think best within a broad national framework. All other parts of the education system will share a collective responsibility and work within a strong framework to support schools to succeed. Presenting officer, we have excellent teachers who are hardworking and committed to raising attainment for all. Many children and young people fulfill their potential. Exam results are very good and improving, and the overwhelming majority of young people leave school to go into a job, training, or continue their studies. We have a strong curriculum which has the needs of children and young people at its centre. These trends do not, however, mask the challenges that we face. There is still too much bureaucracy generating unnecessary workload for our teachers. We remain committed to freeing teachers to teach and continue to work with their professional associations on further steps we can take to achieve this. We fully recognise the message of PISA and the SSLN results. They reveal the significant hurdles to be overcome if we are to make progress on raising the bar and closing the attainment gap. We can and we must achieve more. That is why we embarked on a programme of reform. The National Improvement Framework and the Attainment Fund have laid the foundations for what I am setting out today. In particular, the Pupil Equity Fund has put £120 million directly into the hands of our head teachers. When we launched the Governance Review last September, we set out to engage directly with teachers, practitioners, parents and professional bodies across Scotland. I would like to formally place on the parliamentary record how grateful I am to the many individuals who spoke to and for the written res responses that we received. I am also publishing our analysis of those responses today. No one will be surprised to hear that many of the responses from within the education system argued against change. But very few respondents expressed satisfaction with the status quo and many respondents expressed real concern about elements of the current system. We also examined a wide range of evidence to inform our approach, including from the OECD, the International Council of Education Advisors and from children and young people in Scotland themselves. Advice from the International Council has been clear. To improve our education system, we must tackle culture, capacity and structure, and I'm taking a blended approach to address all three. Presiding officer, the centrepiece of these reforms is a package of sweeping new powers for schools so that education is led by teachers, parents and communities. We will put the power to directly change lives into the hands of those with the expertise and the insight to target resources at the greatest need. Schools have the expertise and insight to target resources to greatest effect, so they will be responsible for attainment, delivering improvement and transforming children's lives. This will be supported by a new structure with three key pillars. Enhanced career and development opportunities for teachers, improvement services delivered by new regional collaboratives and support services from councils. The evidence is clear that the strength and quality of leadership in our schools is crucial to delivering improvement. We know that head teachers want to focus on the delivery of learning and teaching, not to be chief administrators of their school. We will therefore give head teachers more power over decisions on learning and teaching, 
freeing them to make a real difference to the lives of children and young people. At the heart of this will be a statutory head teachers charter. Head teachers will be the leaders of learning in their schools, responsible for raising attainment and closing the attainment gap. They will be free to select and manage the teachers and staff in their school. They will be free to determine their own school management and staffing structure, to decide on curriculum content and to directly control a significantly increased proportion of school funding. International evidence shows that involving parents, families and communities fully in schools improves attainment. So that is what we will do. We will enhance parent councils and modernise and strengthen the legislation on parental involvement to enable all parents to play a role in their local school and particularly in their children's learning. And to ensure that schools interact more effectively with families who find it difficult to engage, every school will have access to a home-to-school worker to make and to maintain such links. Children and young people must be at the heart of our education system and we will strengthen their voice through more effective and consistent pupil participation. Presiding officer, parents should be involved in the wider running of schools and we have seen an increased desire for autonomy in the proposals that have been put to us, including from St Joseph's Primary School in Mulgai. As part of the governance re review, we have carefully considered each application on its merits. I recognise what these parents are trying to achieve for their schools and their children. But I am acutely conscious that schools also need support frameworks to function well. The reforms I am setting out today will significantly increase the autonomy of our schools, the role of parents in school life, and ensure that our schools are rooted in their communities. Crucially, however, our reforms deliver this within a clear national and local framework of policy and support. That collaborative approach is a key strength of the Scottish system and critical to improving attainment and closing the attainment gap. I therefore cannot agree to pursue the specific proposals from parents at St Joseph's and elsewhere as they would remove schools from that crucial support structure. I consider, however, that we are delivering on the autonomy and increased parental involvement that lies behind many people's support for the plans that have been put forward in good faith by the parents of St Joseph's and other schools. Presiding officer, schools will lead, but they must have the support they require to succeed. So we will back them with a new support structure around the three pillars that I mentioned earlier. The first pillar, enhanced professional development and career opportunities for teachers, will see teachers strongly supported throughout their careers. Professional learning and collaboration are key to this. We will streamline and enhance professional learning so that there is a coherent learning offer to teachers improve support through collaborative practice in new regional models and school clusters will also significantly build the capacity of teachers. We also know that some teachers have been frustrated at the lack of opportunities to progress in their careers. So we will work with the profession to design new career pathways to develop and to reward leadership skills, pedagogic ex expertise and subject specialities. And we will undertake reforms to initial teacher education to ensure that new teachers are well prepared with consistently well developed skills to teach key areas such as literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. Finally, we will continue to develop new routes into teaching that attract a broader range of high quality graduates, including in priority areas and subjects. A formal procurement process will shortly begin for new routes, routes into teaching. But I can be clear today that any new route into teaching will require to meet the GTCS tests, including a partnership with a university to maintain credibility and academic rigour. This government will not remove this crucial guarantee of the quality of teaching in Scotland. Presiding officer, we recognise that the success of a school and teacher-led system rests on the availability of the right support, support that is not currently available consistently across the country. We must build the capacity for educational improvement within the system by putting in place the second pillar, a revolutionised offer of support and improvement. We will establish regional improvement collaboratives to pool and strengthen resources to support learning and teaching in Scotland's schools. Led by a new regional director reporting to the Chief Inspector of Education, these collaboratives will provide educational improvement support through dedicated teams of professionals. 
These teams will draw on Education Scotland staff, local authority staff and others. They will facilitate collaborative working, sharing best practice, supporting collaborative networks and partnership approaches tailored to their local area. I welcome the steps that have already been taken by some local authorities to embrace this approach and we will work with local government to expand and to deepen this work. These collaboratives will provide a coherent focus across all parts of the system through an annual regional plan for educational improvement aligned with the national improvement framework. We know that our teachers want to constantly improve for the simple reason of wanting to do better for our children. This will help them to do that. The third pillar of support will be delivered exclusively by local government. Local authorities will retain a vital role in our education system with responsibility for a wide range of education support services, including the number and catchment areas of schools in their area, the provision of denominational and Gaelic medium schools, the administration of placing and admissions procedures, including for children with additional support needs, the provision of back office support services such as HR, and securing excellent head teachers for the schools in their area. Taken together, this is a crucial role for councils in ensuring schools have the support framework and services that they need. And by retaining this important local accountability, we, re we retain vital democratic accountability for the leadership of Scotland's schools. Councils will also have new statutory duties, a duty to collaborate to support improvement on a regional basis, to provide staff, including head teachers and teachers, to work within the Regional Improvement Collaborative in partnership with other local authorities and national agencies. Presiding officer, an empowered system underpinned by collaborative working and a strong improvement function will operate within a clear national framework the Scottish Government and national bodies have a key role to play in this regard. As part of these reforms, Education Scotland will undergo significant change with strengthened inspection and improvement functions. These functions will remain together with inspection, acting as a crucial tool that supports the system-wide goal of continuous improvement. We will give Education Scotland a renewed focus on professional learning and leadership, providing clarity and coherence to the national landscape. This will incorporate the functions of the Scottish College for Educational Leadership and will be delivered via the new, national, the new regional improvement collaboratives. This will mean that hands-on advice, support and guidance can flow directly to more schools to support improvement. We know that current support can either feel inconsistent or distant and we must re reverse that. As Parliament will be aware, Bill Maxwell, the Chief Executive of Education Scotland, is retiring on the 30th of June. I can confirm that on an interim basis, Karen Reid, Chief Executive of the Care Inspectorate, will lead both organisations, supported by Graham Logan as Interim Chief Inspector and Chief Education Advisor. The process for the appointment of a permanent Chief Inspector of Education, who will also lead Education Scotland and be my Principal Education Advisor, will start in the summer. One of the strengths of our education system is that we have national teacher professional standards underpinned by a national registration scheme. We recognise that there are many other professionals, such as education support staff, who play a key role in educating our children and supporting our teachers, but are not currently part of a national registration scheme. We will therefore consult on establishing an Education Workforce Council for Scotland, which will take on the responsibilities of the GTCS the Community Learning and Development Standards Council and register other educational professionals. To support these system-wide changes, we must have an approach to funding which ensures that control over resources for schools sits with schools. The consultation on fair funding I'm publishing today seeks views on how we can achieve that. As our proposals make clear, I have ruled out the development of a fixed national funding formula. Presiding officer, it is clear that the reforms I've set out today cannot be delivered by government alone. They will require partnership working, shared effort and real focus on delivering change in every part of the system. I commit the government to active engagement with our local authority partners, the professional associations and with other stakeholders to take forward this agenda. I also acknowledge that the government does not command a majority in this parliament, so we will work with other parties to build agreement around these reforms. 
Some changes can be delivered without legislation, and we will work with partners to deliver these quickly. For changes that need legislation, we will bring forward an Education Governance Bill in 2018. At the heart of all of our reforms is a simple plan. We will free our teachers to teach. We will put new powers in the hands of our head teachers. We will ensure that parents, families and communities play a bigger role in school life and in their children's learning. And we will all, government, councils and agencies, support our schools to do what they do best, transform the life chances of our children. That must be the vision of all of us for the future of Scotland's schools. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 30 minutes or so for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Liz Smith. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This Parliament knows that for several decades the Scottish Conservatives have wanted to see a school system that gives real devolution to head teachers. So with regard to the general principles of these reforms, we are very pleased to see that the SNP is now supporting that direction of travel. Yeah. The Cabinet Secretary is quite right to say that the status quo is not an option. And how could anyone argue otherwise, since it is the incontrovertible evidence that shows Scotland's schools are facing so many fundamental challenges, especially over standards of literacy and numeracy. The Cabinet Secretary, however, will not be surprised to hear that we do not believe these reforms go far enough particularly when it comes to extending choice and allowing schools to opt out of local authority control if that's what parents and teachers want. So may I ask them three specific questions. Firstly, why is it that within the spending of the Pupil Equity Fund, head teachers will not receive full autonomy, but instead will have to abide by both local government and national government guidelines as to how the money should be spent? Secondly, and after all the evidence submitted to the Education Committee in recent months, does he really believe that it is credible to have the Inspectorate remaining part of Education Scotland when that body is also undertaking the development of the Curriculum for Excellence at a time when there are so many question marks over the delivery of it in our classrooms? And thirdly, is the introduction of regional education boards not completely counter to the Scottish Government's stated aim to devolve powers down to local communities? Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, I, I uh, welcome the comments that Elizabeth has made about um, empowering schools and head teachers. I believe that's the right step to take to ensure that the decisions about the education of our young people can be taken by those that we entrust to lead that education process and who have the greatest opportunity to affect uh, that approach. Now, let me deal with the three specific points that Liz Smith raised. First of all, on pupil equity funding. Um, I think that pupil equity funding has made a huge impact on Scottish education already because it has given head teachers and schools and communities, because head teachers who are acting wisely in this respect will engage their schools and their communities in determining how best to proceed with pupil equity funding. It has given them the flexibility to address the needs of young people within their care. And I think what, what I'm trying to strike in the reforms that I'm making here is the balance between providing the autonomy to schools to be able to take the decisions that matter to young people, but by providing the support that enables head teachers to make wise decisions. So any guidelines that are available on PEF must be supportive guide, guidelines they must be advisory guidelines. They cannot be the type of restrictive instruments that prevent head teachers from exercising sensible judgment, sensible educational judgment about how that money should be uh, distributed. And certainly in my conversations with head teachers, they value having guidance about how to utilize those resources, but they equally value having the freedom to spend the resources in the fashion that they can justify educationally why it should be the case. Now, secondly, on the question of Education Scotland, and I recognise this is an, an issue which has been debated extensively within Parliament. And, I've, and as I indicated in the debate we had in this some months ago, I've considered substantially this question. If we were to separate 
the inspection and improvement functions and for there to be leadership of those functions uh, held separately within our education system. We would be requiring <coughs> schools to work out whether they should follow the signals of the inspectorate or follow the signals of the improvement organisations. And what inspection to me is all about is about being part of the improvement function of education. And that's the vision that we have for inspection. Inspection is a contributory factor in the design of improvement mechanisms within education. And thirdly, on the question of regional um, collaboratives, they are what I say they are. They are mandatory collaborations between local authorities and Education Scotland so that we pull together our combined resources to have more effect on improving education in individual schools. Now, why is that important? It is important because today, in not every part of our country, schools can rely on a strong, specialist uh, and effective improvement function to, to be at their disposal. And that's not good enough. Every school in our country must be able to rely on such a resource. And what we intend to create by the joint working of uh, local authorities, Education Scotland and experienced educationalists is regional education collaboratives that will fulfil that purpose. Ian Gray, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I know the uh, Cabinet Secretary will fully expect me to begin by welcoming something that he's done. Uh, so let me say I'm delighted that he has dropped the idea of centralising school funding in a national funding formula. Well done. And I also welcome the end of his flirtation uh, with the idea of opt-out schools. However, the first of the two funding options on which he is now consulting, uh, the one called a national approach to devolution of funding, does appear to suggest he still wants to decide individual school budgets centrally and nationally. So can he explain how this is different from a national funding formula? I've also uh, always had an open mind on regional collaboration as long as this was aimed at providing pedagogical and subject-based support in the way the old regional advisory services used to. That could really support classroom teachers <coughs> excuse me, in their work. But regional improvement collaboratives, centrally appointed regional directors and annual plans can you explain how this is not just another layer of bureaucracy and how it will support the classroom teacher uh, in uh, that classroom? And finally, uh, consultation responses uh, to the, the governance review from teachers, from parents, from educationalists and from councils all said the same thing, that the first reform we need is more teachers properly paid, properly supported and properly resourced. Why is his statement nothing to say about that? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, um, let me welcome the, the, the first two points of uh, welcome that Ian Gray gave. But I think he'd, um, even Ian Gray would acknowledge that it is a duty of a minister to consider propositions that are put to him by members of the public. It's part of your fundamental duty as a minister. So it's not a case of my flirtation with particular concepts. It's me exercising the duty that Parliament would be rather surprised if I didn't exercise in considering proposals put to me uh, by organisations around the country. In relation to his three points, the first of them on the funding mechanisms, what the first option in the consultation document, and I stress it's a consultation document, it's an opportunity for um, members and for different interested parties to make their contribution to the process. What it does is essentially take forward the opportunity of giving more uh, control to individual schools within uh, a framework of design of, what, of, of particular components of education expenditure, which would certainly flow through local government and into particular schools, but it would do so with conditions attached in that process. It's not a national approach because we wouldn't be deciding all of the elements of that process. Um, on Mr Gray's second point, um, and actually I hope, I hope we can make some progress on the common ground here because the vision that Mr Gray outlines there of a pedagogical and advisory support arrangement available to enhance the quality of learning and teaching is exactly what I want to create. 
but I want to make sure it's got pace and drive about it to improve education in Scotland, which is why I want the regional directors to be accountable to the Chief Inspector of Education, who will have the responsibility uh, to ensure that we are constantly pursuing improvement within Scottish education. But the vision that Mr Gray talks about, its purpose, is exactly what I want to see in place because I think we need to have more specialist expertise available to enhance learning and teaching at local level within individual schools. And finally, on the question of um, the teaching profession, the, uh, the government um, has put in place the resources which are now leading to um, an increased number of teachers in the profession. Uh, we are putting in place through the mechanisms that I've set out here, a strengthening of the educational development functions of the system to ensure that we enhance learning and teaching. These are some of the elements that the teaching profession have been calling for and which I'm responding to positively to enhance the pedagogical and advisory influence that's available to strengthen learning and teaching in Scotland. Thank you. I'm now moving on to que further questions. I have 13 members wanting to ask questions. The clue is in the word question. Ms Gilruth, first please, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I remind members I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the report published by the National Parent Forum of Scotland, which says that moves to engage parents in their children's education have been largely successful but need to go further? And can he outline what impact he expects strengthened parent councils to have on our children's learning? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the National Parent Forum Scotland undertook a, a very good and rigorous review of the legislation that's in place and they've made a number of recommendations which the Government will take forward as part of addressing the commitments we've given in the governance review. Um, there's two elements of response to Ms Gilruth's point that I, would, that I would make. The first is that pupil, uh, parent councils are an opportunity for head teachers to engage in creating a real community of interest to advance education. As I indicated in my response to Liz Smith, there's a lot of very good evidence already that parent councils have been heavily involved in the design of how uh, pupil equity funding can be taken forward and how that can be, have the most impact within the system. The second point I would make is, is, is as important as that, and that is about the engagement of parents in their own children's learning. And again, active involvement and in steps to ensure that parents are more actively involved in their children's learning has been proven by international studies which we cite in the consultation document response to have significantly enhanced the achievement and attainment of young people and has contributed to the development uh, of a stronger performance within education systems and i would like us to take action on both of those in both of those respects thank you jeremy balford followed by james dornan can i thank the cabinet secretary for his statement can i ask for just three clarifications Will the head teacher have the power to employ and sack teachers in his or her school, or will that power lie? How many regional collaboratives will there be in Scotland, and will any councillors be part of that regional grouping? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, the first point is that head teachers in, under the Charter uh, will be. Uh, responsible for the, um, the selection of staff within their schools, but they will not be the employers of their staff. The local authority will remain the employer. My judgment is that I don't want to go from having, if I think 32 HR systems is enough or too many in Scotland, I don't want to move to two and a half thousand. Um, so the local authority will be the employer of teachers, but head teachers will, and will deal with HR matters but head teachers will be free to select the, the teachers that teach in their schools. But obviously for any issues of performance and other matters, the local authority would have to be involved in these questions, but obviously um, at the instigation of the head teacher. Secondly, on regional collaboratives, um, I am not prescribing how many there should be within Scotland, but they will have to involve a number of local authorities, and I'll obviously consult with local government on exactly um, that, uh, that question. Um, I have in my mind that there should probably be six or seven regional collaboratives in Scotland, but I'm not wedded to those numbers. Um, and thirdly, um, I don't envisage councillors being on these collaboratives. I envisage them being um, collaboratives of educational professionals who will work together to enhance 
the, exactly the support that I talked about to Mr Gray of pedagogical ex expertise to be available to schools. Um, but again, I'm prepared to discuss these issues with our local authority partners. Thank you, James Dornan, followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, the Education and Skills Committee recently took evidence from teachers and workload was a recurring theme. And whilst I welcome the reassurance that the Cabinet Secretary has provided that teachers will continue to be the leaders of learning, can he expand a wee bit further on the support that will be available to teachers and how this will improve their current situation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, first of all, let me say to Mr Donnan that uh, I remain very focused on reducing workload because that is a necessary step to free up the space to enable teachers to enhance learning and teaching. Which brings me on to the second point in response to Mr Donnan, that the enhancement of learning and teaching is at the heart of the governance review and it's why we're taking the steps to draw together the work of Education Scotland and the work of local authorities in the regional collaborations to make sure that classroom teachers have available to them a range of expertise and specialism which will enhance the quality of learning and teaching and we believe that blend will significantly assist teachers in fulfilling their potential. Thank you Daniel Johnson followed by John Mason. Thank you. Regarding the Cabinet Secretary's remarks about alternative routes to teaching, can he confirm what the minimum amount of time spent in lectures and on supervised placements respectively will be under these plans? How will this uh, compare with uh, PGD and other current teaching qualifications? And as this is following a procurement process model, can you advise as to what the criteria that, that will be used to be uh, assess those uh, and award these bids? And uh, wh what are the organisations? No, no, yeah, it's one question, tender? not a whole sequence of them. Cabinet Secretary. With no disrespect to Mr Johnson, I suspect we could have a, a long parliamentary committee session on exploring the detail of that question. I think there's a, a, th th these are all valid points to raise. Of course they are. Um, but let, let me say two things to Mr Johnson. The first is that some of the questions that he raises are material to the composition of initial teacher education courses. And he knows from my appearance at the Education Committee that I have, that I have a question in my mind about the variability in those components and that's an issue that we need to explore with the colleges of education. Secondly, um, whatever steps we take on any of the detailed questions that Mr Johnson raises, we must have, must have assurance on the quality of the uh, propositions that are coming forward, which is why there has to be an academic partner and it is why there has to be GTCS assessment of these particular routes to satisfy us that the quality of the route into teaching is of a sufficient standard to give us confidence that in identifying a new route into teaching, which may be a shorter route into teaching, quality has not in any way been compromised. John Mason, followed by Ross Greer. Hey, thank you. To follow up Jenny Gilruth's question, um, we have areas in Glasgow, certainly especially poorer areas, where there are no parent councils in the school because parents have been very reluctant to get involved in a parent council. Can the Cabinet Secretary suggest how we deal with that? Um, Cabinet I, Secretary. I, I, I think the, the, the way to deal with that is about encouraging parents to be involved in the school as part of the learning process. Um, I was um, on, what day was it? Monday? Monday? I think it was Monday. I was in, yes, it was Monday. Um, <laughs> I was in St Thomas's Primary School in the east end of Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary, you're Mad speaking away from your microphone. I know it's out of politeness and courtesy it to is, somebody at the back, but, but it's out of, nobody it's, can hear you. It's disrespectful to you, President Officer, my apologies. Um, I was in St Thomas's Primary School in the east end of Glasgow um, at Smithycroft on Monday, and I was visiting a, a marvellous project where the young people were articulating their understanding and experience of the Holocaust, uh, both in the Second World War um, in, in, in Europe in the 1930s and 40s, but then also in Darfur in recent periods. And I saw at first hand magnificent learning and expression by the young people, but I also saw significant parental engagement in the project and the process, which I thought was one very good way of encouraging parents to be part of their involvement in the schools through the learning process. So it may be that the learning process encourages more parents to become involved in the uh, development of the school. But I certainly saw a very good example of that at St Thomas's Primary School on Monday. 
Thank you, Ross Greer, followed by Tavis Scott. Thank you, my colleagues. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. He began by saying that head teachers don't want to become chief administrators, but then announced new responsibilities they'll have to take on over the recruitment, management of staff and of budgeting. Is this not an example of the wider problem? That being that this exercise is not one that was asked for and will not resolve the key issue in Scottish education. That over the last 10 years, we've lost 4,000 teachers, over a third of school librarians, over 500 additional support needs teachers and hundreds of support I hope you staff. heard my sigh. Yes, do, please. We've had your question, that, please. That, that is the question. Sit down. Yes, thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I, I would reiterate to Mr Greer that I have absolutely no intention of creating head teachers as, um, as chief administrators of their schools. But what I do want them to be is leaders of learning. Mm -hmm. And if they want to be leaders of learning, and I don't meet a head teacher who doesn't want to be the leader of learning, they want to be the leader learning instead of the chief administrator in the school. M many of them say to me they cannot be leaders of learning because they, are not, they do not have sufficient control over what they are able to do in the school and in their selection of staff. Now, I answered Mr Balfour by making it clear that I'm not going to set up HR systems within individual schools. That is not what is envisaged here. Local authorities will continue to provide that support service to individual schools. But I do want head teachers to be able to have the discretion to choose the staff that will work in their school so that they can design the most effective way to deliver an effective curriculum for the young people in their care. And that, to me, is the sensible route that will enable head teachers to make a profound impact on the lives of young people in Scotland. Tavish Scott, followed by Fulton McGregor. Does the uh, Cabinet Secretary accept that I agree with his direction of travel but not his logic on Education Scotland? Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary confirm that under these proposals, education regions will have to follow the National Improvement Plan, as indeed will schools, that the Improvement Plan is, of course, the Education Secretary's, and that the Chief Inspector of Education, now to be the Principal Advisor to the Education Secretary, will be his Educational Policeman? Therefore, does he not accept that instead of decisions being taken at a school level, which I entirely agree with, many people will see these proposals as a top-down structure, where Scotland's educational future is determined by Ministers here in Edinburgh? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I don't accept that characterisation and I'm very happy to discuss these questions in some detail because I don't actually think Mr Scott and I are in any way in disagreement about this. I want schools to be properly empowered to take the decisions that will shape the learning of young people in their care, but I want them to be well supported in undertaking those functions, which is why I'm undertaking the reforms I'm undertaking at national and regional level to make sure that all of us, whether we're in local government or in Education Scotland or in the government, are actually supporting that process of reform. It's not to prescribe. I think one of the, you know, one of the really interesting issues that we wrestle with in education is the level to which issues should be prescribed. And I don't want to be prescribing issues because that would be alien to curriculum for excellence. But I do want schools to be able to take those decisions but to take those decisions well supported by the regional and national infrastructure that's in place. Now, I've come to these conclusions on Education Scotland and on the inspection and improvement activities. From, from good analysis and sound reason, I'm very happy to discuss that at length with Mr Scott and anyone else to try to get to a point of agreement because I want to proceed on these reforms with as much agreement as I possibly can do. Fulton McGregor, followed by Brian Whittle. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that moves by councils like the Labour Tory run North Lanarkshire to divert pupil equity funding from its intended purpose into core education funding will do nothing to help close the attainment gap of free up, free up teachers' time? And does he share my anger no, no, the decision got, of the administration in North Lanarkshire to cut hundreds of classroom assistants from schools Mr. McGregor, removing diverting support from funds, those children please sit who need it down. the most? Cabinet Secretary. Pres President, officer, I... Um, Pupil equity funding has been allocated to make uh, what I hope to be a profound impact on the education of young people and it should be used for that purpose and the government is in active discussion with all local authorities, uh, many of whom have responded to this approach um, uh, really effectively uh, to make sure that we, um, we see the pupil equity funding being used in the very effective way that it should be to enhance learning and teaching for young people and to close the attainment gap. 
Thank you. Before I call Brian Whittle, can I say to Mr McGregor, when I tell you to stop, you stop. You do not keep speaking, and that goes for all members in this chamber. Uh, call Brian Whittle to follow by Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, I note that COSLA are committed to moving uh, regional collaboration forward in co-production with the Scottish Government, building on existing collaboration which already occurs between local authorities. With that in mind, with reference to the new regional collaboratives, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what relationship will these have with local authorities and what role will they play in deciding on school policy? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I welcome the statements that have been made by the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on Regional Collaboration. There's a very good example in the north of Scotland, the Northern Alliance, which a number of members will be familiar with, where the seven local authorities have, seven local authorities have come together in a voluntary collaboration, and what they are doing is pooling resources to ensure that right across the seven authorities, they have access to resources which can enhance the quality of learning and teaching. It's not about replacing deciding policy. It's about how to provide support to individual school development. And that's the key part of the reform agenda I'm putting forward to Parliament today, or one of the key elements of it, is to create that support which will enhance the quality of learning and teaching in our schools so that the pupils in classrooms um, are able to be on the receiving end of enhanced support in the, educational, in the delivery of education. And if we can make progress on that swiftly, which I think there is absolutely no reason why we can't do that, I think we'll begin to see the fruits of that in Scottish education very quickly. Thank you. Call Claire Hockey, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary has said about children and young people being at the heart of our education system. Could he outline how the Scottish Government has ensured their voice has been heard throughout this process and will continue to be heard? Cabinet Secretary. I had, um, we had a number of sessions which uh, I attended. I think Mr Macdonald also attended some, and Ms Somerville as well, the, uh, with young people which were facilitated by um, Young Scott and by Children in Scotland. And the format of those events was conducive to understanding and appreciating some of the perspective of young people, which has been reflected in the governance announcements today. Um, I intend to continue that type of dialogue and I also gave a commitment to Mr Greer in earlier discussions that we will involve young people in some of our um, uh, national deliberations on key questions to make sure that the perspective of young people is heard very directly uh, on these points. Call Monica Lennon, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you. I welcome recognition in the Cabinet Secretary's statement um, that international evidence shows that involving parents, families and communities fully in schools improves attainment. The proposal or the announcement that every school will have access to a homeschool worker sounds very positive. I don't hear a question. It's just coming, Deputy Oh, Officer. I'm not waiting any longer. Can the Let's Cabinet Secretary the say how many of these workers we will have, what the cost will be? And while he's in the, 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 the mood to look at evidence, will he still consider the, the proposal for school-based counselling as well? Well, Cabinet Secretary. The, 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 these, these are all questions that I'm happy to explore as we move to the detailed implementation, which we will take forward in partnership with our local authority colleagues and with other stakeholders. Um, there is um, very good evidence, and some schools have already done this through the attainment challenge, of establishing home-to-school link workers. It overcomes. I saw some very good evidence of how successful that had been on a visit to the uh, Inzivar Primary School, which I think must be in my colleague um, Somerville's constituency, um, where um, very good success, which had enhanced the access to learning for young people, had been taken forward. So we'll, we'll explore those questions in detail with our local authority partners. Jamie Green, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary says that he cannot agree to proposals from St Joseph's and Mulgai and others because it would remove such schools from crucial support structures. Does the Cabinet Secretary not uh, accept that head teachers must have the freedoms that these proposals called for? Which support structures does he think an autonomous school might lack? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the, point, the, point I'm, the point I'm making here is that I've, I've looked carefully at what are the uh, the, the demands that have been made and the proposals have been put forward. And I understand exactly the motivation, and I, I don't in any way question the motivation of anyone bringing forward these proposals. I totally understand it. Um, but what, we've, what I'm providing through this statement is a level of flexibility and autonomy within schools which substantively meets the aspirations that have been brought forward by 
the, the, the groups to which Mr Green referred. But what concerns me is that our system operates on the basis of, yes, there being an amount of discretion and flexibility within schools, but also schools being able to rely on quality support to enhance education, because we must be able to give a guarantee of effective education to children in all parts of our country. Now, in that balance where there are competing points of view, my judgment is that the amount of flexibility and autonomy that has been proposed under these reforms substantively addresses the issues being raised by the parents of uh, pupils at St Joseph's Primary School. And on that basis, I've come to the conclusion that I've come to, uh, to ensure that the schools that are in our system are able to rely on quality support from the reforms that I've set out today to Parliament. Thank you. Richard, I'll follow by Graham Simpson. Thank you, the last questioner. Last question, and then we'll move on to the next item of business. Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. In the speech, the Cabinet Secretary said, and I quote, the heart of this will be a statutory Head Teachers Charter. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Head Teachers Charter will be developed in partnership with the profession? Cabinet Secretary. It, it will, President Officer. Graeme Simpson. Um, if there are to be no councillors on the new regional bodies, um, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us who they will be accountable to? Will it be him? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, there will be collaborations between local authorities and it's about sharing expertise. It's not about top-down control. It's about sharing expertise because the problem we've got today is that in some parts of the country, our schools are not able to rely upon a sufficiently strong pedagogical and educational support service. I can't allow that to continue, so I'm doing something about it, and this is my solution. So it's not about me controlling it, it's about me making sure that in every single part of the country, every school can rely on strong expertise to support the delivery of education. That's the point of the reform. Thank you. That concludes questions to the Minister. And before we move on to the next item of business, allow a few minutes for the front benches to take their places.